I want to know what you, who you think among these might be the greatest European thinker. Anybody got an idea? There are lots of great thinkers here. Yes? Erasmus. Erasmus! What a great choice. We're going to come and talk about Erasmus in a moment. I want to ask you, though, another question related to one of these. You've got to figure out who it is. There's a, a person who was asked, do you speak English? And he said, to speak English, you need to put your tongue between your teeth. And I have lost my teeth. Um, anybody know who that was? Close to Erasmus. Voltaire. It was Voltaire, absolutely, yes. And uh, he was an enlightened thinker, um, but perhaps he wasn't enlightened enough to go with the English language. The English language is becoming um, increasingly important across the European Union, and many of our greatest thinkers now go into the Berlin building in, in Brussels. And, uh, and work for the European Union. The European Union has given us great things. For example, it's given us the uh, framework, the common European framework of A1 to C2, and something we're all familiar with, and we thank the European Union for this. Um, but we also thank the European Union for Erasmus in his new uh, role, which is not as a great thinker, but as, a, as an exchange program. In 1997, I was lucky enough to get Erasmus funding to go to Spain for an exchange and participate in studies in a university in San Sebastián. And thousands and thousands of students across Europe do this every year. Maybe some of you have done so as well. However, it's not just students who go and exchange anymore. It's also teachers. And it's quite, oh, it works this time. It's quite interesting that Peter was talking about, uh, about working with teachers because my, spe my speech is also a little bit about working with teachers. And they come because the European Union and their native governments are pushing them to use English in their classes. Um, in France it's known as Discipline en Linguistique, or in German it's called Bilingual Unterricht, or in English you can call it CLIL. I'm sure it goes as other names as well, because many teachers are not really that keen on doing it. They have a lot of reluctance. I've been teaching my biology class in German for the last you know, 25 years. Why do I have to teach it in English now? Okay, well, I know a little bit of English. I'll teach it exactly the same way. Well, no, because a CLIL course is meant to be a content and language integrated learning system. So that's basically what CLIL stands for. And there are four C's in CLIL. Well, actually, according to the theory, there is. Um, we call the first one content, which is what the teachers know about uh, most themselves. So presumably they know their thing, but if they come to a, to a CLIL teaching or teacher refresher course, or teaching methodology course, which they might do, um, hopefully we're not going to focus too much on the content. We're going to focus on the things that we as ELT professionals, because that's what we are, can offer them. And the fact is that the European Union is providing funding through the Erasmus program for hundreds and hundreds of teachers to come to Britain and Ireland to get tuition in how to use CLIN. I think this is something that's very relevant for our industry here in Ireland. Um, and what we can give them is the third, the second and the third C's, and also the fourth one. We can use communication, which is what <coughs> we do in our English classes all the time, and we can use cognition, which means that you think about what's happening, and, and you think about the material in a new way, and that helps us to learn, and maybe that's how, what helps us to get over that maybe experience bias, um, and we can, we can learn something new by interacting with it on a cognitive level. And the cultural aspect is to think about maybe geography, like rivers and mountains and rocks and so on, from a different perspective. So not just thinking about France but, um, and French geography, but also thinking about maybe mountain lakes in Ireland, or rock formations in the Burren, rather than in the Massif Central, for example. Okay, so what kind of, what kind of teachers come, what subjects do these, do these teachers have who are coming for these little courses? Basically, it's the whole range. And you can think of anything from biology to history, geography, etc., sciences. But it's not necessarily the subject that matters. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the thought or the thinking. So it's the thought that counts. It's the thinking that counts. And it's the, it's the way that we, as English teachers, teach our subject that they can learn from us. That's what we can offer these people. So, so the idea of cognitive engagement, engaging with the material, as a learner who is dealing with it and looking at it from different aspects and thinking about how I can manipulate it and so on. And so we need to use our ELT procedures. And the European Union, in its uh, writings about CLIL, 
wants to, in, uh, to impart this concept of procedurally rich collaborative tasks like we have in ELT. Um, so, so what are our ELT methodologies? Well, there's a whole range. Um, of course, the community approach, which is the one that we're most familiar with and that we've been doing for that, the last 20 years, but also Michael Lewis's lexical approach, where we're learning information and words and, uh, and content from texts without knowing it before we start. We learn it, we learn it without being taught in advance. And of course, we have pre, while, post, and all the other things that we think about in our English methodology all the time. Um, let's say, well, I'll just go back for a second. Um, we might have missed that this is an Irish bog. And one of the things that I teach in my course when teachers come is about the Irish bogs, because they're quite unique. And I think it's important to offer something that people <coughs> who are coming don't know anything about, so that they can experience the idea of learning something that they don't know anything about to the English language, and that's what happens. And so one of the tasks might be um, to figure out how the bogs are formed. And this is a great um, slide which shows the bog formation in the right pattern. But as an English teacher, what would you do if there was a, if there was a reading? So recently I had a group from Austria. They were all architecture and design students, and there was one economics teacher among them. And they were the ones who knew about this content. So I didn't really focus on that. They, uh, one of the students took, or I guess teacher trainees or uh, teacher refresher to people, she took this photograph here herself and you can see it's got, it's got a nice composition, she knows about design, she knows about architecture a lot more than I do. What we can focus on again is the communication aspect between you know something and I don't know something. For example, we've got a word, we've got uh, maybe a crossword and you've got all the across clues and I've got all the down clues and we share them with each other. However, the concept of cognition would take it a lot farther. This would mean that instead of being just the communicator and do, doing the thing that we just described, you would create the clues. You would understand the concept that's included in that word called, let's say, let's say bog or turf or peat. And then you create a clue and then you offer that clue to another person. And this cognitive process is what's going to help the students to learn. And, and the teachers, when they hear this, oh my goodness, it's amazing. I've never thought of this before. And they haven't. We've got so much to offer. And what I'm really saying to you is, as ELT professionals, we have so much to offer other teachers who are involved in non-discipline courses, let's say non-biology courses, or, or biology courses. And we're going to be doing this thing, which is giving them the ELT methodology that they can use in their biology or their geography or their history class. And the culture, well, that's an interesting thing. It's like, why, would, why does an Irish window open on the left instead of on the right? Or, in this case, and we're very lucky that the, uh, the students or the participants stayed mostly in a B&B &B here in Galway near Salt Hill, and the lady of the house brought them into the kitchen and gave them a cookery class, and someone took a photograph, and they're making brown bread and Irish vegetable soup, you know? So the cultural aspect is a new perspective. It's like not making yeast bread, we're making bread with buttermilk. Oh my goodness, quite interesting. And, and you can see, she knows her content. So she, she's got everything laid out. They've got nice concepts in the right sequence, first, second, th third, and so on. It's a procedurally rich engagement with the material. Everyone's involved, everyone's got a different role. He's got the recipe, they're explaining it to each other, and they're learning, and she's not really doing all that much, kind of supervising, facilitating. And, uh, and it's learner centered. The learners are at the middle of the course. And this is the English language teaching methodology. This is what we do every day. So, um, when do the teachers actually get it? And your question was an amazing question a moment ago. Can we let people learn by their mistakes? And of course, I think, just like you said, I think we can. And it is, it, the idea would be that they do micro teaching. And in a one week CLIL program, Potentially, you're thinking, oh, I'll do the micro-teaching at the end when they've understood all the theory. Well, actually, I started on the Wednesday of a five-day program, and we had one or two on the Wednesday, and they do it, and it's very collaborative, and they're all involved, and they're doing their thing, but, but it only lasts for 10 minutes or so. But the feedback and the discussion and the interaction afterwards, that's where we give the time. So it's maybe 30, 40, up to 50, it depends, and on 50 minutes on the feedback session. And the people then learn from each other, and hopefully the micro-teaching experiences of the next people on the Thursday, and then again on the Friday, 
are even better and close to what we expect it to be. And then the feedback sessions on the Friday are much shorter because it worked. My goodness, I so much enjoyed this lesson. Now I know, now I understand. And people are teaching something from their own area. So um, this is kind of what happens. We brought our course to an end, got some smiling faces, um, but we also went into the pub afterwards. And you can see that some of them have now got their teeth back. They're smiling with their full teeth because they've enjoyed the program. Maybe they're prepared to go back to Austria in this case and teach design through English, potentially. And we have provided them with the ELT light, and we've got the ground under their feet, which is our teaching methodologies, which are concrete, which are possible to support other teaching methods and ideas. And people go home satisfied with their teeth in their mouths, and they're ready to smile and ready to use the English language and the new methodology in the class. Any questions there? I have a question. Um, it's interesting you have the, the Austrian design or the architects. Thing. Yeah, they're architecture and, and design one teachers. One economist. Yes. So what happens, and this is, this is a sleeping problem, you know, you have scientists, you have historians, you have know, all sorts, and they're all coming in small groups, and there's one, there's one economist. Okay. With a lot of design students. What well, the reason she's an, e an economist, they're actually all from the same technical school just outside Vienna, and the reason she's an economist in that school is because they're teaching people to be able to prepare to set up their own companies potentially, mm -hmm. and so she so taught in her micro-teaching about a balance sheet, and none of them had an idea about a balance sheet. But at the end of her micro-teaching, because she was on the Friday, they actually knew, and I think it's a benefit to have cross-discipline um, teachers in the group. If they all know the same subject, then maybe they're not thinking about the methodology of CLIL, they're thinking more about the subject. Mm -hmm. And as I tried to say during the speech, it's basically about the methodology and not necessarily about the subject and the content. That's their baby. 